Hey everyone, welcome to Handing the Shame Back, a channel dedicated to survivors of sexual abuse. We know the numbers are huge and this is one place you are welcome to be to hear other stories and maybe get some support and resource so that you don't feel quite so alone. As with all of it, anything that we put out here, please know there is a trigger warning because something you may hear or see may just uh, flip you into feeling unsafe. If that happens, please do go to the show notes below. We're back with part two, and this is the amazing Angela Williams all the way from Atlanta, Georgia. And here, just a brief recap, from the age of three to 17, when she managed to escape, uh, she was physically, sexually, psychologically abused by her stepfather. And then she had uh, sort of physical and emotional abuse from her mother and tried to protect her younger siblings. So resilience is just one word to describe her. Let's go back in. Welcome back, Angela. Thank you, Gloria. So I think we're at the stage where, you know, you're 17, you're safe. Um, tell us a little bit about your story from that point. Well, I was trying to pick up all the pieces and put myself back together to take one step, put one step in front of the other. And uh, um, after having a suicide attempt, I was emotionally just a wreck and needed to find a job, needed to figure out how to care for myself. I was still in high school, um, trying to graduate from high school, trying to get into college um, with no support, just trying to do all this on my own and figure out Pell Grants and student loans and just all the craziness. And so I um, was trying to get a restaurant job um, and I felt like I could make more money in tips. And I just remember I was still 17, so I wasn't old enough to serve alcohol. So I was sitting on a street corner um, at the bottom of the steps of a restaurant I'd just come out of when they told me they couldn't hire me and just crying my eyes out, just not knowing where to go right or go left down the street. And uh, a Corvette drove up and asked me to get in. And I got in and he um, was an older man, he's probably 45 and started treating me um, with a great deal of kindness and splurging on me uh, clothes and food and um, telling me that he could help me. He could solve all my problems. He would help me get a job. And um, I just needed to do some favors for him. That's all, just favors. And so he had me take these little matchboxes into different bars. He would drive up to the bar and I would walk in with the matchboxes and I didn't know what was in the matchboxes. I was just a gullible little girl. If you remember, I had never even left my yard. We had never gone to the movies. We had never really lived life. I was this sheltered little girl. And so um, he, of course, started having sex with me and I was well-trained in that. Just thought, okay, this is this is what I have to do to survive. And um, he asked me one day to be really kind to um, one of his best friends that was going to stop by. And in the back of my mind, I knew exactly what that meant. And um, kind of wanted to run, but didn't really have the courage to run because didn't really know I was going to run to. So um, the phone rang and I answered it. And uh there was a lady on the other end that um, introduced herself as his wife and that she was pregnant. And so I really just kind of sat down and said, what am I doing? I've got to get out of here. I, I just got to get out of here. This is not the road I want to go down. So I just wanted to make the point that not only do so many survivors try to commit suicide, they also are lured into trafficking because of their vulnerability and because of what they've been through, kind of their conditioning so to speak. So if we want to have any kind of impact on the human trafficking issue, we have to stop children being trafficked down the hallways of their homes. And I feel very passionate about that. 100%. It's uh, the biggest money unit, according to the United Nations globally. 
human trafficking, specifically child sex trafficking, because a child can be used more than once. A drug, it's overtaken yeah. the drug trade. Uh, a drug can only be used once. Uh, so, yeah, it's pretty sick. Angela, what... <laughs> What has helped you in your kind of healing and recovery of all of this? Well, I was pretty much a hot mess um, through my <laughs> college. My, I, a lot of alcohol, a lot of drugs, a lot of passing out, a lot of blackouts, a lot of not remembering, a lot of trying to numb the pain. I think um, textbook when it comes to survivors trying to heal looking in all the wrong places, um, really horrible relationships, getting into more abusive relationships. Um, and then I met my husband and he has been my Prince Charming. I, I met him when I was um, a little, probably 18 and a half years old and um, really um, ran from him. I kept telling him, you need to go find a good girl because I'm not a good girl. I, I have so much baggage and so many problems. I will make your life a living hell. You just need to go find a good girl. So we were really good friends for a long time. And until one day he just said that he had fallen in love with me and he would never fall out of love with me. And um, I wrote in my book, my first book, this is a love story. This is our love story from Sorrows to Sapphires. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's the beautiful journey of um, him holding my hand through the pain and through the nightmares and through the bad behavior. And uh, we were married when I was 20. And we've been married for 38 years and he's still my Prince Charming. So I think having someone that love and that support um, and growing in my faith and knowing that, um, that I am loved and that I am innocent, I can recapture that innocence that was taken away from me. And so there's been a, it's been a long journey. I, um, and I was at the suicide's door again in my late twenties, but my husband stepped in and I got intensive therapy. I um I did outpatient. My husband had some trauma as a child. His mother was an alcoholic and she was hospitalized. And so that terrified him. But he went every day and took me to therapy and I stayed all day and he was there to pick me up and um, just really held my hand. So I am a huge believer in mental health and that it's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength and that we should get checkups just like preventative maintenance on everything else in our body. We need to continually take care of our minds because if we don't, then that's where a lot of sickness and illness begins in the stress. And I love what you're saying. I think, too, survivors uh, watching this, you know, it's one thing that still has this awful stigma. And so what happens is as you're talking, I'm I'm thinking, yes, that would be so, such a powerful thing to do if as well as having a checkup with a GP two or three times a year, a mental health professional checkup. I'm a huge proponent of that. And I still go to a therapist, even if I'm feeling great, because I want to continue to grow and I want to continue to heal. And I don't want to ignore maybe some signals or some signs that I can't look in the mirror and see. And so I'm a huge proponent of mental health and just having a confidant. You know, I have my husband, but a friend or or a pastor or someone that you can just go and spill your heart with and that, that you feel confident that it's going to stay confidential. So I'm just a huge, huge fan of mental health care. Mm. And, and what has it done for you? I'm thinking the mental health professional bit or checkup bits. What have you kind of noticed with that? I'm just trying to get other survivors um, yeah. to yeah, so it, 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 yeah. helps, it helps me. I put a lot of pressure on myself. I often get out of balance because I want to save the world and Angela can't save the world. So, and I have huge goals and sometimes I, I don't give myself enough compassion or enough grace. And so it helps me to understand that maybe I'm trying to accomplish the impossible and just kind of order my life back to the, where there is balance and just to have an objective person to to have to just kind of throw up on and them tell you oh 
no wonder you publish 15 books in a year, because let me tell you, nobody's really done that. So, you know, so just things like that, just to put things in perspective when you lose perspective. I love that. And it just, I, I don't know if you've heard this, Angela, but I, I love what you're saying because I think it's of such value and it's not something uh, survivors necessarily would can always consider doing. Um, you know, because finding our voices was, of course, we were conditioned never to speak. And so that can be really challenging. But I love what you're saying, because if it is, as you say, someone to throw up on, great, <laughs> better out. Yeah. Than but the, um, yeah, it, interesting. The the other thing I guess I'm I'm wondering is, what actually, you know, you met your amazing husband. He's still your, you know, your prince, uh, charming after 38 years. Awesome. I'm so thrilled to hear that. And, you know, therapist or mental, mental health has been great. Any other modalities you have used that you've found have really lifted you? Absolutely. Reaching back and serving others. Um, breaking my silence in public. I've been on a number of um, broadcasts across the country, across the United States. I've probably been on over a hundred broadcasts and documentaries to break my silence and tell my story without shame or without um, hesitation to hopefully help another survivor. So I think reaching back um, and serving others and being an advocate for others and being an advocate for children. Because my entire childhood, there wasn't a teacher, there wasn't a pediatrician, there wasn't a dentist, there wasn't a neighbor, there wasn't an extended family member. There was nobody, nobody that asked, why does this child have uh, black and blue stripes all down her legs? Why does this child uh, not look me in the eye? Why does this child uh, constantly lie? I had a fourth grade teacher I went to and said, I had been raped. They called my parents in and they said, this child said she's been raped. This can't possibly have happened. My parents said, oh, she's been watching too many soap operas. We're gonna have to cut the soap operas off. That's where she got that word. We went home, I was beaten to a pulp. I was beaten so bad. I was like, I knew I would never open my mouth again. So I so just just bringing that into the communities and let them know what the signs and symptoms are, letting them know how they can be a voice for a child, letting them know what prevention techniques are, um, just trying to trying to help in this epidemic. It's an epidemic. It's not getting any better. Like we have we need survivors healed so we can be the voice. We are informed. We we have the trauma-informed knowledge that we can share with others. And yeah. then I would say writing. I'm a writer. I, I write books. That's that's a way that I can duplicate my message the quickest and get them out there. So I write children's books. I write adult books. I write training books. I write um, my self-help books. Um, I just released Loving Me After Abuse. So I'm really proud of this work because it really is a, an honest um, conversation. It's an honest conversation about the pain that I've gone through and how I've learned to love myself, which has been one of the final frontiers. I think the shame takes us over. The shame en engulfs every part of our being and our mind. And we have to just peel that shame off to say, no, I am a wonderful person. I'm not what my abuser said I was. No. And that's why we have handing the shame back, because when we talk, we're handing the shame back. But where can people get your books, Angela? Anywhere books are sold. Um, a lot of people go to Amazon, Barnes & Noble. You can go to your local bookstore and just ask for it, and they can order it. Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, can I, we just go back, because there's, there's a lot of things you're, you're saying that I think survivors are are really uh, going to be nodding their heads at and being able to feel aligned with. And, you know, as you talk about serving others, I guess I just want to bring you back to that and ask you, how, how does that work? What are the benefits? And what did you, how did you come to find that as a way of healing for you? I think serving others is profound. Would you be able to share that? 
So I started my advocacy journey in the early 90s, and I wrote editorials for our local newspaper about child sexual abuse, which in the 90s was just like, oh, I was, it was very taboo, very extremely, yeah. so much more than it's today. So I started there, then I started working at my local advocacy center, and I didn't do anything grand, but I took care of the children while the, the parents were doing parenting classes. I helped with fundraisers. So I started at my local advocacy center. Then I founded a, a, I started writing my book, my own memoir, From Sorrows to Sapphires. Then I found when I published that book, I had survivors coming out of the woodwork and, and I didn't have any resources for them. So I'm like, okay, I need to develop some resources. So I started a support group. So I do a support group twice a month. Um, a community support group. Anybody can come, male, female. Um, I try to keep it adults, but sometimes I'll take, you know, 15 up year olds. And so the support group has been wonderful for the community for a resource. And then I do time to heal conferences where I gather survivors and we just talk through the trauma so they don't feel so alone and they don't feel so um, overwhelmed and just paralyzed in their pain. And, and we help process through some of that pain. Um, and then I'm always in the community speaking. I love to support um, sister organizations that are doing this work in any way that I can and being a voice or helping them, um, just supporting them and encouraging them. I mentor a lot of um a lot of founders of organizations to kind of help them. So any way I can serve, uh, I've been so blessed that I um, I have 15 books now um, out there published um, that anyone can find. They can go to my website. It's just angelsvoice.com. But I'm constantly looking for ways that we can protect the next generation. And that to me is the most important work that I do is I, I can stop a child from being sexually abused while they're being groomed, that somebody can recognize that behavior and step in. Or if I can give a child the courage to speak up and tell an adult what's happening, um, then I, I can lay my head on my pillow at night and sleep well. Yeah. So I think uh, you would love this then. Repeat after me. Palm up, thumb across close first so that's a global hand signal I released it in June this year for I that, love that. for okay. children under 16s to indicate they're not safe and we awesome. yeah oh that is so exciting Gloria but I can't we, wait to duplicate that okay one all right two, two, that's two. awesome and we tested it on children as young as two and they can okay. do it okay so, great because we know that children struggle to speak. We know that only 10 to 15% of children will ever find the words. And you think back to your own journey, you tried to tell them what happened, you got slammed. So I think it's a, it's a big construct for children to speak. But children can show. They haven't been told not to show. So, yeah. So, look, I think, you know, when you you talk as well about this has obviously helped you with healing and I guess I'm just wanting survivors to be able to hear what has helped you and I think in the serving of others what have you noticed for yourself as a healing modality if you're using serving others how has that helped you with your own kind of recovery healing from this well it's helped to know um, because as you as you help others heal, you hear their stories, you hear their struggles, and it's like, oh, I've been there. I, I know what you're going through. Yeah. So to be able to use your trauma, use what you've been through to help somebody else to recover. Um, I think when we see that there are so few resources and people are so limited to mental health care, um, financially, or even having the services and my state of Georgia, we have 379 for the entire state of licensed professional counselors. Wow. That, yeah, uh, that's just mind boggling. So to be able to be a resource and to be a shoulder and to um, help maybe find services for someone, it just helps me to feel very rewarded um, at the end of the day. Um, and yeah. Feel, feel just 
that this didn't happen for nothing. There's purpose yes. in it. Yes, I love that. And and also, too, for those survivors who are thinking, oh, I can't do that. I'm not quite ready to do that. I'm sure, Angela, you would you would agree. It doesn't much matter what you choose in terms of serving others. You could help the lady up the road who struggles to get to the supermarket. You Absolutely. Could, yeah. And I would just tell them, just find an advocacy center and they have have all kinds of events going on. They do runs, they do walks, they do, you know, just show up and support them. You don't even have to say anything. No one has to know you're a survivor, but you're there and you're showing their support. You've just frozen on the screen a bit, Angela. Um, so while Angela's coming back to us, I will, um, yeah. So look, Interestingly, she's mentioned many ways that uh, her healing and recovery has been helped. And one of them, as we know, is serving others. And that can be, as I said, uh, it can actually be supporting other survivors if you're ready to. It might actually be trying to uh, help the next door neighbor. It might be helping a mum who's just had another baby. Um, you know, by looking after her child. It doesn't much matter what you choose to do, but the gift with serving others is that the giver actually, believe it or not, gets a bit more back. So look, we seem to have lost her, but I'm so grateful for what she's brought to us today. And I know that she helps a lot of people across the world. And I think it's really powerful one of the other key things she mentioned, which I really love, is that she has a husband who has been there for her. And I think for you amazing survivors, if you have one person in your life who you can trust implicitly and is there for you, that's going to help your healing, you know? And they don't have to be perfect, but if you know that they've got your back, that's so powerful. And how grateful are we to them? Um, she also talked about writing. She's an avid writer. Maybe for you it's art. Maybe for you it's painting. It doesn't much matter what it is. The main thing is that you're able to do that. So I think, you know, what I can see is this. Out of all of these amazing guests that we have on and the interviews we do, please take what works for you do some cherry picking if something feels appealing that might have your name on it uh, there is no right way there is your way so as always beautiful ones i see you i stand beside you and i believe you